So anyway, that was just sort of uh, the way my father was. He just, he had a great, uh, you know, sense of humor and, uh, you know, all, uh, all, all the way until he passed. And he had done the, he was in the military in World War II. And I'm sure that also had <laughs> some influence on yeah. him as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he was in the military, he served as a newsreel cameraman, and uh, then ended up teaching at West Point, uh, teaching photography at West Point for a, a while. And then he went into photojournalism and, and, and such. So. so you're like 32 or so when you, when he passes and you're kind of now starting your, you know, really starting your career at that point. Is that right? right? That, that's uh, re really, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was making a living from the time uh, from 1980, from 1983 or four, mm -hmm. I was making a living off of right. my artwork. Right. Almost every show I had from 83 on was a sellout. Right. My first one man show was at Johnson Cranick in Dallas. That was in 85. And that's the only show I didn't sell out. And that show I didn't sell anything. And so I had borrowed all this money and, um, I remember, you know, coming back from Dallas and I was, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to pay off all of this money I borrowed at the bank? And I ended up going up to, um, going up to Oklahoma and trading off a bunch of the artwork after I picked it up at the show and trading for antiques and jewelry and anything else that I could find and uh, sold. Uh, I remember I sold everything I traded for except for a watch. And I kept this watch. That was the only thing that I was uh, able to make as profit uh, off of the show, but I did get the note paid off. And then, you know, there was also a point where we had, um, uh, the a gallery, uh, the oil business took a dive in 19, I think it was right, maybe 1988, 87 yeah, right. or 88. That yeah, was right in that. And time. Yeah. yeah. And the gallery, yeah. um, I was in, I was working for Clark Wiggins. That was when my, my parents were in partners with Jim Clark and the gallery business, it just went under. And yeah. so I lost my job. And I remember you know, thinking, you know, what, what am I going to do? They had, they called me in. They said, you know what? Uh, I, I'd been managing, uh, they had a gallery in Rudosa. They had a gallery also in Palm Springs, California. And so I had been traveling back and forth between the two and uh, would, would manage one for a while and then manage the other one. And so I lost my job and I'm like, what am I going to do? And I, I remember going home that day. I, I lived in Rudosa at the time and I went home and I'm, I was like, I don't want to start, you know, applying for jobs downtown at, you know, whatever the, the, the bank or, or wherever else I have uh -huh. to go. And so I started painting and I took all of my work and I piled it into my car at the end of the month. It was like maybe the 28th or something like that. And I drove to Lubbock, Texas, and I went to Texas Tech University and they have all these mansions that are built all the way around Texas Tech University. Mm -hmm. And I just went and started knocking on doors. I'm a young artist trying to make a living. Would you be interested in looking at any of my work? Slam, go to the <laughs> next door, knock, knock, knock. I'm a young struggling artist. Would you be interested in looking at, you know, slam? Anyway, about maybe by maybe two or three o'clock in the afternoon, this little lady, I don't know, she, maybe she was in her 80s, 70s or 80s. Um, she was old, uh, you know, to me, I was in my 20s. And uh, she said, young man, you look like you could use a drink. Come on in here. And so, and bring some of your paintings. Let me take a look at them. And so she fixed me some iced tea and sat down and she bought one of my little paintings. It, it was an 11 by 14. And it was a snow scene of a, of a church that, that I had done, New Mexico church, had some, a couple of people coming out of the, the church, going down the steps. And I think a dog. And anyway, she gave me $500 for it. Uh -huh. And I ended up leaving Lubbock that evening, driving back home. And I was like, man, I hate this. I hate knocking on doors and asking people to buy my own work and, and show my own work. But if I have to do this every month to pay the bills, I'll do it so, so I can make a living as an artist. And so that, that was sort of, you know, that was the, probably the lowest point as far as my 
uh, monetarily and as far as, you know, gosh, am I going to be able to make it as an artist? And, and that lasted for, you know, some time. But, uh, you know, uh, eventually the some of the galleries, like I said, started handling my work and stuff, uh, other galleries, like, uh, and, and I, I ended up being okay. Yeah. And so Jeff Klein, when did he come to Santa Fe? Do you remember when? Uh, he moved to Santa Fe, it must have been 90. Four, I yeah. believe. Yeah, yeah, ninety-four. Mm-hmm. And so, and so it, in the nineties, you were doing. You found your style in nineteen ninety. That was when you had that first show that you did half and half. And by ninety-one, correct. You're set now, and what, you, or at least you have what you think is your vision of what your voice should be, right? Definitely, I knew that I had something different. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I'm self-taught. My work doesn't look like everyone else anyway. Uh, no, it doesn't. I didn't go. I didn't go through the school where this is how you do everything. Right. And and so everybody's work, you know, sort of comes out. You, you know, there's obviously variations and stuff like that. But my work just looks very different because I'm self-taught and I didn't go through school. And at first, it was a big problem. And you know, I remember being at one of my shows in Santa Fe, and I was standing around one of the walls. Uh, a partition visiting with uh, a, a collector. And then on the other side of the partition, there was a teacher from the Art Students League and another really big named artist in Santa Fe that, that, that became a good friend of mine. But um, I, I, that person left that was talking to me and I could hear him talking. And the, the professor from the Art Students League says, oh my gosh, look at this stuff. I can't believe that they let this guy have a show here. This is, <laughs> I, I would never let my students do this. And I, I remember the other artist said to him, well, maybe that's why he's making a living as an artist because he just sold out his show here. <laughs> and so uh, I, I knew my work didn't stand up as far as, um, you know, as far as aesthetically, you know, m- maybe. But, but I knew it was unique. Well, and, it stood um, up. It, it stood up. The problem was it was different, so different that he couldn't appreciate what was in front of his very eyes. The same way I'm sure there's other art critics would have saying the same thing about Alexander Hogue when he would start to do some of his Dust Bowl stuff, that they would have said, what in the world is this? Yep, and, that's true. And that's how, does this true. Even, how does this even relate to the Western, you know, mm-hmm. aesthetic, this, you know, lone skull in a, you know, desert of, you know, hills. Sand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? And so. That's a good point. Yeah. Who's I mean, going to buy, who's going to buy a dead cow laying in, yeah. in the dust, you know, with a half, a fence halfway covered up. Yeah. Well, know, I, think, too, the, I think one of the things that you do and he did too, is your paintings also, you're a storyteller. So, you know, I, I, you know, even if it's a small little painting of a church, there seems to be, in my mind, when I look at it, I can see a story there. There's mm-hmm. some kind of a, um, you know, whether you trying to do it, you know, literally, or you're just letting the, the viewer make their own interpretation, but that's what it seems. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me if that's. No, I, I, I completely agree with you. My, both of my uh, grandparents were storytellers and I just come I come from that type of tradition and you know my grandfather would tell me these incredible stories when I was a young boy he he went on his first cattle drive when he was 14 years old to Abilene Kansas and you know I remember him telling me about uh, you know how he was trying to get a room and uh, you know he and the other youngest boy were the last two uh, all of the older uh, cowboys got the first choice of the rooms and by the time uh, these two youngest boys got to the different hotels, there were no rooms left. And finally, his friend found a room. My grandfather went to the last hotel and, uh, you know, the woke the guy up and he said, well, yeah, you know, uh, I don't have any room, just you don't have to get, get on out of here and stuff. And, you know, my grandfather would tell me these stories and, and uh, as a young boy, I, I think those were sort of set into my into my heart. And then as an artist, I began looking at my work. I, I really believe I, I'm a sort of a, a modern day storyteller. That, that's my job. 
Yeah, I agree. That's what it looks like to me. And when you, how do you decide what you want to do from a standpoint of your next work? Um, you know, uh, as an artist, I, I constantly have a backlog of works that I am waiting to do. I, I don't know if it was, I, I suppose in some ways, maybe it came from Mr. Hogue. Uh, in other words, um, he focused on working in series. Um, Emil Bistrom tended to work also in series. And so I, I tend to work in series. I, I find it difficult to de fully develop a subject in one painting. And so, uh, for example, um, you know, the piece that you saw th this last weekend uh, was from the Goodnight Loving Trail series that mm -hmm. I've been working on since 2012. I also have a series that I've worked on for several years on the Alamo. I have another series uh, um, that's on uh, historic battles uh, in the West. And so, it, you know, I've, I've done the Battle of the Little Bighorn. I've done the Fetterman Massacre, uh, uh, the battle, Second Battle of Adobe Walls. And so, so these are things that I'm interested in. And I uh, have a backlog of uh, developed because I love reading history, uh, American history, uh, uh, American history. That's my roots. And my job as an artist, I, I feel like you know, the artist is the soul of a society. And our job is to relate to the next generation and beyond who we are as a people. Uh, the reason I paint Western art is because I believe firmly that Western art is the iconic American work that will ever be created. There's nothing that will compare to it. Uh, I'm not saying anything negative about abstract, uh, but there's two schools of art that were developed in America. Um, you know, back at the turn of the um, 19th century, artists traveled to Europe to study art. That's where all of the great art schools were. And so anybody that was going to make it as a, you, you know, as a bona fide artist, they felt like they had to study in Europe. And when they came back from Europe, they wanted to create something that was truly American. Part of those artists gravitated to New York City. New York City was the future. It was the modern mechanized world skyscrapers. And, you know, if you look at uh, some of the great artists in America, that's where they focused on their work. The other artists, the other school, went the different route. They went to Taos, New Mexico. And so you find this incredible school of art that's formed out in Taos. Taos, unlike New York, which was the future, hearkened to the past. It hearkened back to the Garden of Eden. It hearkened back to who we are as a people going all the way back into mankind's past. And so these artists were heavily influenced by Native American work. They were heavily influenced, you know, all of those artists were influenced by the 1913 Armory Show. That's where modernism yep. came into American art. And so you had artists that started traveling back to Taos. You had the Taos founders that were formed and artists like Blumenshine and Higgins. And, uh, you know, uh, you can go through the, the, the whole you know, List, Dutton, and uh, everyone else, or you can look at George O'Keefe, and you can look at Dosberg, and Bistrom, and um, uh, the different artists that, that visited, like John Marin, and Stuart Davis, and these people came to Taos, New Mexico, because it represented that other aspect of America, and of course, O'Keefe grasped hold of that, and her most uh, important work is not the work that was done in New York. It's the work that was done in New Mexico, because that's what truly speaks to America. And so if, uh, if you look at any culture, I don't, uh, 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 any of the great societies, whether it is uh, the Chinese, the, the Romans, the Greek uh, society, uh, uh, go to India, go to uh, any of these great societies, you recognize the culture 
because of the artwork. Now, one day America will be in that same boat. It will be a past culture. I think, and we may be there. I do. And we are. And it is Western art that will define who we are as a culture. I think Western Western art will never be. Yeah, I think Western and Native. I think it's both, honestly. Uh, well, I see. I consider native uh, a, a part of Western b- yeah. because it's all of the West. Yes, I agree. And, 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 and so, so that uh, I, I, I agree with you. I, yeah. uh, I'm not uh, uh, saying anything different than that. But it's not the abstract that will be recognized as American. That's a one world type of art. Yeah, I agree. And it can be confused with many cultures. The Western art, the art of the West, let me put it that way, the art of the West, whether it's Native American, whether it is Western realism, whether it is New West, whether Western modernism, whatever it is of the West, that's the aspect of America that will be identified later on as true, in my mind, as truly American art. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. In fact, I there's no confusing. I completely agree with you and have, have made the same point on on publicly more than once. And I think you could even get more granular than that and look at people like Dixon, who is mm-hmm. Western born from, you know, Fresno. If you look at all the Taos guys, you know, whether it's Sharp, Higgins, Blumenschein, any of these or Lee or Remington ooh, for any of these guys, none of those were actually born in the West. They all that's came, very true. Yeah, they all came to the West to paint. They came West. to the West. And then you have yeah. Armin Hansen, you have uh, Edward Boreen, you have Maynard Dixon. Those individuals actually are born of the West. So I think yep. you as, I, as I am, yeah, I'm the next absolutely. generation. Yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly right. You are exactly of that same kind of thing. And I think you mm-hmm. are of that next generation of what the West is. That's why that guy couldn't figure out what you were or how you belong in that show Mm -hmm. because you were early. You were, you were the basis of what, where a lot of things are evolving to. I think Uh, I'm sure you've already started, have started to see individuals that you can go, Oh, that's kind of my thing too, that they're, you know, they're on that same thread. Um, so I, think I can it, definitely see influences in a, a lot of different artists today, but, um, uh, you know, I've been around a long time and I, I you know, right. I'm, I'm younger than, uh, you know, uh, some of the uh, other artists that are sort of considered the old timers, but I have been on the market, um, you know, a, a similar time period as, as some of these, uh, uh, artists like, uh, like Billy Shank and, uh, and, uh, Ed Mel and, um, yeah. Howard Post and, and yeah. people like them. Yeah, you're 20. So you're, you know, 15 to 20 years younger. And so mm-hmm. you're at that next inflection point, I think, in, mm-hmm. in, in influencing people. I mean, you look at what you're doing. I mean, you just won a major award at the Briscoe, right? Uh, you know, that was yes. a huge, important award. And that's just one of many. You're in so many uh, major collections now. You know, you're at the Staples Center. You're all these you know, and it just gets modified and expanded more with the use of social media and that kind of stuff. And maybe you could even kind of describe some of that and how that is affecting what you're doing now, you know, with the, and, and how you reach out to new people and, and how people find you. Well, um, you know, social media is a, a, a different animal that that's for sure. Um, and I, I think I probably, um, you know, I, I'm of the age uh, like you. Uh, I, I still remember where uh, you know computers were. Um, you know, new to the scene uh, right. back in when we had our gallery on Canyon Road. But you know, now um, you know th- there's there's a couple of things I would say about that. There's some wonderful aspects to social media. And I try to share um, as, as best you know, possible. I, I don't want to be a slave to photorealism, but I also don't want to be a slave to social media. And so I, I try to do my best sharing with people. And I've had so many uh, new collectors that have come through Instagram or Facebook. And, um, uh, you know, I uh, also have a, a, a uh, website as well, kimwiggins.com. And so I have a, a presence on the internet in, in that respect. Um, 
and I try to share new things that I'm working on and what I'm doing. And, um, and yet, with that said, I also live in an isolated part of New Mexico for a reason. And I try to isolate myself because I have watched so many artists, you know, if you flip through your phone and you're, you know, you're sitting there going through your phone, you're going image after image after image after image. And I've started, you know, in the last, maybe the last five years, just started noticing how much of the work becomes similar because everybody's influenced by everybody else. And it Mm -hmm. sort of becomes this one world, you know, thing that's going on. And so, you know, in my work, I've tried to isolate myself uh, in Southern New Mexico. I look at my work much like a scientist does. If you're conducting an experiment, you don't take it out into the world where it can be tainted and exposed to other elements. You shut the door, you make sure you're isolated and you're in a sterile environment. And I try to do my exploration here and I try to stay away from the influences that are out there because there are so many influences that can affect your work. And I try to expand my work um, within a controlled environment. Yeah, that makes sense. And I actually you know, have a good sense of where you live now, and you really are isolated. Mm-hmm. And I think not only are you isolated, but I mean, it's a fertile ground, in my opinion, for inspiration, just the environment. For sure. Oh, and yeah. I mean, you, you know, the Hondo Valley and I do. Uh, how beautiful that is. And, yeah. and your wife's from that area. So you have deep, roots, deep roots to yeah. it. The necklace that now, you her have, family. <laughs> have on comes from there, right? <laughs> I don't know if you want to talk yeah, about she, that or not. Her, that's a pretty amazing necklace that you have around your neck. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is my my mother's um, from her ranch. She had uh, two uh, big ranches out in Arizona, um, uh, the Black Rock and the Pinta Ranch. These were uh, both in the Holbrook area. Uh, the, the Black Rock is where this one was, was found. And uh, she was riding one day. Uh, and there was, uh, she, she saw some color in, in an ant bed and stopped. And uh, it was some of the reflections of the black beads that are here. And so she started, um, started digging back in those days. Um, uh, you know, this was back in the early 50s or probably around 1952 or so. Um, you know, people uh, didn't think anything about it. Anyway, she dug up all these different beads and took them and uh, had them strung and sent them to the uh, University of Arizona to find out what they, what they were. And they um, identified the black rock. They said it was very rare that they'd uh, only seen it a handful of times and that it's volcan- volcanic rock. And then of course the other uh, stones are turquoise and they dated it somewhere they, they, they said that it was a wide span somewhere between uh, 300 and maybe 800 AD. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, she, um, uh, she, she had a, a life out in Arizona before she married my father and, um, uh, you know, was very in, involved uh, in ranching. And so she also, part of her ranch was uh, a bordered Hopi land Part of her ranch bordered Navajo land. One of the sacred Hopi mesas was on her ranch and her house uh, was at the base of the mesa. Mm. And so they had the young man's coming out ceremony um, every year um, uh, there, uh, you know, right by her house. And she became uh, good chief, uh, friend, friends with one. Of, I, I don't know if you'd call him the chief, but w- w- one of the, the main elders. And yeah. I know that uh, sh- she has a, a ring that was made by uh, by him, uh, uh, you know, from that time period. And, and, and a lot of other uh, Navajo jewelry. She had a um, also had a nightclub in Holbrook that was sort of the stopping point for a lot of the bands that were traveling to Las Vegas back in the day. And so it would um, pay for their gas, for, for them to stop. And so Bob Wills and Hank Snow and a lot of, you, you know, the, the old time 
Western swing artist would stop there and play at her nightclub and then go on to uh, Las Vegas. And so, I mean, she had like a, a really hip uh, club uh, in the 50s uh, out in the middle of nowhere along Route 66. And so, uh, you know, she, she was a, a, a very adventurous woman. When she was 16, she rode match races at what would eventually become Rudosa Downs racetrack. It just had a straight track back then. And so she's uh, done a lot of different things. She rodeoed. I've got a rodeo program uh, sitting right over there that my dad and my mom are both listed in. Uh-huh. And uh, it's from Hobbs, New Mexico, oh, wow. uh, 1946. Oh, and so, you, you know, just, just a lot of... Uh, 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 of crazy stuff so well i can tell you one thing right now kim is that has to be a series for your paintings that that <laughs> life scene of what your mom did and the bob wills and those kind of guys i mean that's just to me that's just ideal yeah, yeah it's it would make a great subject for sure and the and the corral bar is still there yeah um, it would be unbelievable i, don't know I mean it, it's your history I don't know if it's... <laughs> and western history and you know it's telling that story right of uh, what you know the 50s and 60s were in america yeah yeah it was uh, a, a new, unique time in, a, in american history that stuff must weigh on how you interpret everything that you do that family history and the land and all that it does i you know i feel like um there as we talked about earlier there are very, very few native New Mexicans. Yeah. There, there, there are very few artists of the, that, that are from the West. I mean, yeah. you know, there, there's a lot of artists from everywhere else that paint the West, but there are very few from the West. And so I feel like growing up in the West, um, I feel like I have a voice and I have something to say that represents this part of the world in a different way because I understand it. And, um, you know, I grew up here. This is my heritage. It's my people. These are my stories, uh, my country. Um, uh, And and so uh, it belongs to me. And in many respects, I I look at other artists uh, at times and I think, uh, you know what? This is my story. And I'm telling my story you're telling someone else's story. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and yet, you know, that is, is, is life. And that, uh, you know, uh, you look at the Taos founders and, that, you know, uh, like you said, most of, uh, most all of them, if not all of them, all of them uh, came, all of them came from different areas yep. to New Mexico. Yep, they all did. <laughs> well, so, anyway, I, I'm I'm very grateful and very thankful for, uh, you know, for my past and 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 all of the different beautiful things that have been sewn into me, uh, not just by my family but by uh, other artists. Well, I would think that one of the reasons there are not that many artists that come out of southeastern New Mexico, which you and I are both from, is just the environment. Let's face it; it's ranching, farming oil mm-hmm. pretty much and yeah and the arts aren't as a general rule um encouraged i don't think yeah. um as That's much true. and i think that parents go this is a very hard thing for you to do you shouldn't probably do art that's not really a that's not really a way to make a living even your father and mother who understand yeah. the arts that do the arts are afraid for you even though they've seen you make it since you're 12 years old, are afraid for you to go down that route because they know how hard it can be. And I, I, I agree. Yeah. And, and I, I have to say, I have five children and my wife and I, with our five children, tried to direct them every way we could into something else. <laughs> and yet with that said, I felt like, okay, if I can't, direct them into something else they were meant to be an artist and so we've pushed as hard as 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 hard as any parents uh to uh, we made sure all of them received their their college degree um you know uh and and yet with that said we have three that are in the arts and we have two that are not one's an engineer and one's a doctor and the other three are in the arts all different 
forms of art. There, none of them are oil painters. Yeah. And so, uh, you, you know, that's, uh, I know how difficult it is. And, and I mean, even the last 20 years, I know how difficult it is. Every month, uh, you know, you wonder, well, um, mm-hmm. gosh, I hope we have a, a, enough coming in this month. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, you're making a living, you're working for yourself. And um, you, you, don't, you don't know for sure whether your work is going to sell when you've put, you know, months of labor into a show and you pay for all of the framing and you send it off and, you know, shipping. I, you know, I think about uh, the Masters of the American West show and every year, you know, when I have my shipping from New Mexico out there, uh, I don't ship by FedEx or UPS. I had a forklift put through one of my major works once and had a load shift that uh, trashed out another one once. And so I always either take them myself or if they're too big, I uh, have somebody like Art Delivery Service of Santa Fe deliver them. That's very expensive to do that. And so you go to these shows knowing it's a gamble. And so an artist is probably one of the biggest gamblers in the world. And, you know, you could you could line up with anyone in Vegas and get good odds because you're you're doing the same thing. You're taking a chance on on yourself, on your work, on whether it'll speak to people. And if if you've been true to yourself, true to your work, then it will speak to them and eventually find a home. I, I know, you know, God gave me a gift. I know each time I'm painting a painting that it's not for me. It's a gift. And so it's meant for someone else. And I know that that person's out there, but I don't know when they're going to find it. I don't know when they're going to buy it. And so, you know, it may be a while or or it may be tomorrow. I do find it interesting that at your level, because let's face it, you're at the, I think, the upper level of what's being done in Western art, any art, just art today. And, you know, you're exceptionally successful. There's a lot of people want your art and it's going to just grow but you still have that sensibility is, am I going to sell? You know, is it, is it going to cover my costs? You know, mm-hmm. and maybe some of that comes from, you know, an ingrained history of being from a ranching family, you know, mm-hmm. are cattle prices up? Is the wheat yep. crop going to fail? You know, are we going to have a drought? And, uh, you know. Very much, very much. And, and you had to wait to pay your loan off uh, at the end of the year, depending on whether the cattle, you know, brought enough at market. Uh, so, yeah, I, that's probably true. And I think the other thing is um, I, I've, I've had enough difficult times. I know what it's like to have a big sale and go and spend almost all of the money on art supplies just in case I run out of money in a month and a half so that I still have enough canvas and enough paint uh, to, you know, to get the, the work produced and get, get it out there to hopefully make another sale. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, my, my wife will tell you, uh, you know, Maria knows what I am. Uh, she knows how I handle shows. Every show I go to, I'm, I'm very nervous when I go to the show. And um, I, I never, I never assume that I'm going to um, sell my work. I, I you know, I, I always know that it's a gift uh, from God. And, um, and I think all, all of that is just a part of who I am as, as a person. And I, I, I think it probably keeps me humble. I, I, I know, you know, I, um, you know, I can wear a 10 gallon hat at times and stuff, but um, I, I think it does keep you humble when you recognize where you've come from. Yeah. Um, it, it's important to remember where you've come from. And to remember those day, that day in Lubbock, Texas, going around and knocking yeah. on those doors, one after another, slam, another one, slam. And, you, you know, yeah. t- to me, that is what being an artist is about, is being able to ov- overcome obstacles and, you know, whether it was your dad saying, don't go down this road, I think it's a mistake and having enough, you know, feel for who you are and what you are that you have to follow that dream and what you see, or just when it gets tough that you literally have to, if it, if it's required to go knock on doors and uh, yeah. people think it's easy, they see your work and you're in 
all these major museums now and collections and they think wow i just have to find a different thing and just go out and paint it but i, I believe it's a lot more than that and i think your story really yeah. hits home for me and i hope it hits home for a lot of other people out there that you know this is a journey a wonderful journey but you know it's you know you're there's a lot of hill climbing and it's discipline i cannot tell you how many artists i met when i lived in santa fe way more talented than me um way smarter um better looking <laughs> go down the list but but they didn't make it and i i just firmly believe that it is it's discipline you you have to maintain discipline you have to produce the work uh you, you know i had um one of my friends texted me after I got back from uh, from Texas, and they said, "Hey, are you know are you and Maria taking some time off and enjoying things and <laughs> taking it easy?" And uh, you you know I I texted him back and uh, and I, I I said, "Well, you you know uh, uh, may, maybe next week, but but you know you come back and you have a million things that you have to to do, and you have to be disciplined enough to come out to the studio." early in the morning, every morning, and work late at night, every night, and, you know, take off when you can, you know, on Sundays and stuff, and your family sacrifices a tremendous amount to, uh, you know, allow you to be creative. That, that, that's a tremendous sacrifice for a family to make, to allow a person to be creative in the art business. And, um, you, you know, it, it requires, you um, a focus that at times can't be disturbed. You, you know what it's like because you're a writer and you do all of these other things. And, you know, there's times where you have a mind flow and you can't allow yourself to be disrupted uh, because you, you'll lose, uh, you know, I, 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 I do symbolic paintings as well. And I did a painting a while back um, and I usually in those symbolic pieces depict myself as a scarecrow. And there were, uh, there's a bunch of birds flying up and one of those birds is flying off and it's called the awakening of inspiration. And that's the way inspiration is. It lights on your shoulder. It's there for a moment. And if you can grasp it, you have it and you can put it down on canvas. But if you wait, if you take a moment, if you look away, that inspiration lights off of your shoulder and is gone and you can't get it back. And so that, that's the life of an artist. And, and you know, I, I really believe that our, our families are the ones that really pay the, the deepest price when you see an artist that's standing up in front of a bunch of people and they're applauding, you know, and, uh -huh. you know, he's receiving this big award. Really, it should be the family that's up there, the, the wife that should be up there. You know, the, the first thing I did this weekend when I got up there, I, I pointed at my wife, Maria. She, she's the one that has made all of the sacrifices, that's made all of the, you know, difficult decisions that have allowed me to be creative and do the work that I do. Yeah. Bravo. I agree. I, I really do. I mean, it's, uh, and I think you're insightful to understand that you do give up things when you want to create, you know, because it does come at a cost like anything, but it comes at a cost to family time, to interaction, to certain things, because to be successful as a creator, you can't just, you know, you can't just do it when you want to do it. You have to do it all the time and, and, and you need to be able to focus to get it done for the most part. You just can't, you, you need a little bit of a bubble. Um, and but, you're only as great as your last great painting. Mm -hmm. It is a continual, um, uh, you know, when you get to the top of the game, it is a continual struggle to stretch yourself to maintain control, to maintain creativity and passion, and to stay at that level. Well, when you look out and you see those artists, that, and there's, there's not a lot of artists that are at that top level and they're able to maintain that, man, that mm -hmm. is something. 
Yeah. And so, you know, you know, it, uh, uh, you know, there's so many talented artists. Um, if you step back for a moment and rest on your laurels, the world will pass you by in a heartbeat. <laughs> I don't think we're going to have to worry about that with you, Kim. <laughs> well, well I, 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 I do know that. I recognize that. Uh, there's so many talented young artists that are out there. Yeah. Good grief. Oh, my gosh. Look, look at the market today. Yeah. And, you know, they're yeah. so talented. And, you, you know, they, they've got more talent in their little finger than I had the first 20 years of my life. And so, you, you know, I, 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 I admire them. I look at their work and I, you know, I'm in awe. I, re I really am. I'm, I'm in, in awe. Well, I think I do agree. I think the great artists do are self-motivators. I think they look and, and it's just like an athlete, like a golfer, you know, they see the young guys coming, they start to win, but they want to still be relevant. They want to be in the game yeah. and they want to succeed. And, you know, yeah. quite frankly, you're an advantage as in my opinion, you don't really come into your own as an artist till you really somewhere, you know, early forties through, you know, to mm -hmm. 80 and, and you know, maybe even a little less than that, depending on the artist. So, you know, it, uh, it does take, I think, self-motivation to want to stay at that level. Cause you could just go, eh, I'm making, I'm selling art, but I can tell for you, it's something different. Um, on a many levels, I, you know, I can see it from a spiritual yes. point of view as well. And, you know, I, I can see the responsibility you feel that you have for your family and for your legacy, honestly. Yeah, and for my culture, I, I really believe that this, this is who I am as a person. I believe firmly that I was created at this particular point in time, at this particular place in history for a reason. Yeah. And I am going to fight to put <laughs> down everything I can on canvas to my last breath. I've had people ask, well, well when are you, you know, when are you going to retire? And, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, why would I ever retire? I love what I do. I'm, I, 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 I live to, to paint. Uh, th this is my life. And, uh, you know, and so and it's my passion. I'm very, very passionate about what I do. And I, um, I, I feel like it's important for me also to influence the lives of other people. Um, you, you know, there's a, a, a powerful quote I, I, I put uh, it on a piece of paper. It's, it's a long quote, but it's, uh, you know, uh, something that's influenced my life. It's by Francis Schaeffer. And it says there's a flow to history and culture. This flow is rooted and has its wellsprings in the thoughts of people. People are unique in the inner life of the mind. What they are in their thought world determines how they act. This is true of their value systems, and it's true of their creativity. It's true of their corporate actions, such as political decisions, and it's true of their personal lives. The result of their thought world flows from their fingers or from their tongues into the external world. This is true of Michelangelo's chisel, and it's also true of a dictator's sword. As a man thinks in his heart, as a man thinks in his heart is most profound. An individual is not just the product of the forces around him. He has a mind, an inner world, then having thought, a person can bring forth actions into the external world and thus influence it. That's by Francis Schaeffer. It's how then should we live the rise and decline of Western thought and culture. And a, a great book. And a, a book that has really influenced my life because I realize that I have the ability to influence the lives of others. I do it every day through my work. I, I don't know how many people have come up to me and, and, you know, they may not know a lot about art, but they'll come up and they'll say, you know, I don't know what it is about your work. It just makes me happy. And I love it. Uh -huh. And, you know, that sounds like a simple critique of my work, but my work is about changing lives. I, I want people to be able to come home and I want them, you know, maybe they had a rough day or a rough week and they come home and they sit down and they look at their art collection and for a moment they see one of my paintings and it allows them to escape 
into a different world. And, you know, my work, like you said, it's, it's much like the work of a storyteller. And, and they enter that story. And, and it's like entering a child's story, ta- fairy tale, you know, a child's book. And they walk into that world and they enter it. And they're able to, you know, uh, spend a little bit of time separated from the world. And, you know, if, if my work can do that to somebody or inspire them to, you know, a, a, a child, I'm always looking at children to see what they think of my work because they haven't been influenced by all of the prejudices and, uh, you know, of society. And so they'll just tell you what they think of it real quick. And so I'm always looking at them at shows. And, and uh, if I'm in a museum and one of my paintings is in the museum, I'm looking to see what the children do and, you know, see whether they st- stop when they get to my work and take a minute to look up at it and, and, and view the work. And so, you know, you wonder, well, why do you, why, why does he paint the way he does? Why does he, you know, why is his work so colorful? Why, do, why is his work a little bit distorted? distorted? And well, that's why, because I'm trying to grab the next generation. I'm trying to reach out to the next generation, grab hold of them and bring them into the history of the American people. And draw them, draw their thought press process back where they maintain some interest in who we are as a, as a as a society. Well, as a fellow Southern New Mexican, I agree. I will tell you, you've drawn me in. I love your art. I think you're. A, you know, I do. I think you're an inspiration for a lot of people. And I just and I also like to see a, a kid from Roswell do well, <laughs> like really well, and be the. And be the flag bearer for the culture of that area because it doesn't get seen a lot. And, uh, you know, I think it's important. So I really appreciate you having uh, the time, taking the time. And uh, your paintings can still be seen at the uh, Briscoe Museum for their show if people are happening to catch this, which do you know how long that shows up for? Till when it's up uh, through the first part of May. I I think maybe May 8th, something like that. But I also have work in the museum, so if you miss yes, you uh, the That's show, right. there are um, th- this will be the fourth painting in the Briscoes collection. Oh. That that uh, so, so yeah, so stop by the museum and, and check my work out, and uh, and uh, you know I'm uh, I'm always painting, so uh, I'll be at the next show. <laughs> and that's in San Antonio, or and you can also get your work on uh, at your website, right? Kim Wiggins. Uh, yes, my my work is on my website, uh, and um, the main gallery that handles my work is Manitou Galleries of Santa Fe Legacy Gallery yep. of Santa Fe. Um, that that's the the main source for my work, but uh, I I have it uh, in a few other places around the country as well. Yep. So uh, as I uh, create new work, well, um, it's either going to be there or you know I show at the Autry Museum, show at the Briscoe Museum, and. Uh, yep. uh, uh, well, thank you very much for taking the time, Kim. You and I will thank talk. You, I know you've got a uh, dinner, and believe it or not, it's in 15 minutes. Oh, I'll be there. Hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to go. Yeah, we had a nice talk. I'm ready to go. Man, I really thank you for having me. It was really a pleasure. And, um, you know, hey, I still think you were the guy that beat me in high school in <laughs> chess in five moves. So <laughs> it, may, it may have been. Uh, I may have to try to figure out a way if we can figure out who they played. I know it was listed in the Roswell paper. I remember seeing it, yeah. it was on the front page of that paper because we won. Uh, I hope it didn't have my name because I, I, I was, was <laughs> I went home with my tail between my legs. <laughs> well, I was, remember that. If it was me, I apologize. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Well, yeah. great visiting with you. All right, Kim. Very good. Say hi to your wife for me and thank you. And we'll be I'll talking. do it. All right. Very good.